And a very warm welcome to COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. My name is Caitlin Wee and I'm a third year medical student at NUS Yong Lulin School of Medicine. This is a series of webinars presented by NUS Yong Lulin School of Medicine, National University Health System and Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. The COVID-19 Updates from Singapore weekly webinar series will provide viewpoints and insights from a panel of leading experts in infectious diseases and related specialties and disciplines. It is now my honor to introduce you to our moderator, who is also the program director of this series. Recruited to establish an infectious disease training program in Singapore, he was the first infectious diseases head of department in the Communicable Disease Center here in 1992. He is currently Associate Vice President for Health Innovation and Transformation, National University of Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, Associate Professor David Allen. Thank you, Caitlin. Good evening and welcome to the 16th installment of our webinar, COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. We hope you are safe, that your country is on the backside of the second or third wave, and that you continue to find joy and meaning in your life. The topic for tonight's discussion will be learning from COVID-19 to build a resilient future. Our guest expert this week to help us explore that idea is Professor Richard Horton, whom I'll, uh, I'll formally introduce after Dale's epidemiology update. Our format this week will entail Dale beginning with an update of regional and international uh, COVID-19 epidemiology. Following that, I'll have a discussion session uh, with Richard on this evening's topic. Um, we'll Look forward to your questions to help drive the discussion. Richard doesn't shy away from hard questions and there's over a thousand of you watching tonight, so we'll get to as many of your questions as possible. After the Q&A, they'll provide a weekly review of current events and following which I'll summarize tonight's key points, provide a, a preview of uh, next week's guest expert and reveal the mystery pandemic song of the week. Please send in your questions in the country from which uh, you're watching uh, our episode this evening and we welcome your comments on how we can better serve you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dale Fisher, who's Professor of Medicine, National University of Singapore, Young Lu Lin School of Medicine, Senior Consultant, Division of Infectious Disease, National University Hospital, and Chair of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, hosted by World Health Organization. Dale, over to you. Thanks, David. Great. Well, uh... As you'll notice, there's not going to be a completely different look this week in the EPI updates. So uh, stick with what works, I reckon, David. Um, so you can see comparing the, the JHU uh, 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 charts from a week apart. So 23rd of July is this afternoon, 16th of July, you can see there's been another 1.7 million cases uh, diagnosed microbiologically and another 40,000 deaths. So, um, <clears throat> To, to, to move that on, 
uh, as we know, this is being driven by by three countries mostly, but there's four now uh, over 10,000. So this is the, the US, which has had this uh, spike back up after coming out of its lockdowns. Uh, Brazil um, seems to be turning a corner, but uh, I, I'm unaware of any particularly good reason for this. So I'm, I'm not sure how reliable that could be. Um, certainly this one, India, um, is is continuing and they're, they're really struggling with over, over 40,000 cases today, I think. Um, and South Africa, there's uh, a lot of uh, pessimism coming out of, uh, out of the continent. <clears throat> so the, the, uh, the world epi curve, as, as always, you can see the, the little pink line, which is the Western Pacific region. So China dwarfed out here and uh, really a uh, small contribution from, from, from Wipro and, and most of it coming from, from the yellow, which is Pajo and that uh, houses South America and the United States most significantly. So this is why we're, we're getting 1.7 in, a, in a, a million in a week because we're getting over 200,000 cases a day now. Deaths are sitting at around 5,000, quite flat. Um, <clears throat> you've heard me speak before, David, about um, uh, not, not really thinking that case numbers are a, are a good indicator. I'll, I'll talk more about that towards the end, but I'll also talk more about why, why deaths are also probably not, uh, not, not the accurate indicator that we, we might think they are. So these epi curves are all, all similar in shape. Africa continues to, to head the wrong direction. Um, Eastern Mediterranean, some, some uh, <clears throat> countries are driving that down. Uh, Euro, Euro is, um, as I say, two outbreaks. The uh, Western Europe is, uh, is, has numbers coming down and they're uh, obviously unlocking and, uh, well, everyone's unlocking, but, uh, but uh, uh, opening borders and starting to enjoy summer. So that's uh, a bit of a worry. Um, but whereas the Balkans and, and uh, Eastern Europe are, are seeing surges. Pan American region over here, uh, India taking care of uh, the lion's share of these 40,000 cases in the Southeast Asian region. And this largely being driven now by, by uh, Philippines, uh, a bit from Hong Kong uh, and Australia, of course. So here you can see um, China's numbers. Philippines are up 23% in the last week. Um, Japan, I should have mentioned, they're, they're also uh, seeing their numbers continue to escalate. Uh, Australia, likewise, um, with most of the deaths coming from, from Philippines and, and Australia with so many nursing home outbreaks are, are seeing their, their, their deaths climb. So there's 18 deaths in a week there, which is um, uh, novel. <clears throat> So Hong Kong is absorbed in, in the China numbers, uh, with apologies to colleagues in, in Hong Kong. Um, they're seeing double digits uh, every day. Um, I, I think I mentioned before, there are outbreaks in restaurants, particularly one restaurant that, uh, that uh, kept a lot of taxi drivers. So a lot of taxi drivers were, were getting infected. There's now been um, uh, clusters in, in markets. In Kowloon, 12 markets have been closed down for for deep cleaning, so they're, they're increasing their restrictions. Um, as I say, still double figures, but, uh, but nonetheless appropriate to tighten things up there. I've got uh, maximum gatherings of, of four people now. Um, as I look at, at Philippines, there's some interesting stuff happening here. This, I did question these spikes before, but apparently they are real. There are increasing deaths and, and increasing numbers in, in the Philippines. Um, their lockdown ended on, on June the 1st, um, so uh, really since, like with so many places, as soon as you release those restrictions, if you're not prepared, then, then the, the outbreak continues on its, on its merry way. So they're stopping their policy of self-isolation of, of mild cases, and they're going to have more centralised uh, isolation facilities. Um, they're doing it by police going house to house and asking people for symptoms. So that's got to be uh, a bit scary in Manila. But nonetheless, uh, they're, they're, they're not giving up the fight and uh, hopefully we'll, we might see those numbers turn the corner. You know, I'm a, I'm a fan of, uh, of, of sort of uh, supervised isolation rather than uh, trusting people. Um, uh, what we don't see here is, is Vietnam. That was uh, actually, actually on the, the, the previous one here. They, they continued. They haven't had a, a, transmission, a, a local transmission for three months. 
Um, we know they have very over the top responses with, as soon as they see a case, there's almost a lockdown of the whole neighborhood uh, in, a, in a China style with, with mass testing. And in fact, their testing rate is, their positive testing rate is the, the lowest in the world. So their, their cases all come from, from overseas um, imports, all kept in quarantine. Uh, yesterday they had uh, 12 Vietnamese returning from Russia that, uh, that became positive. So um, moving on, um, Bangladesh, this, this fall is because uh, they've started charging for testing. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, Bangladesh is not a wealthy country, obviously. So, uh, so but, but nonetheless, that's going to skew these numbers. So this is artifactual when you used to have about uh, 18 or 19,000 cases a week. Uh, that's, that's now uh, slipping quickly. Uh, there's about 3,000 cases now. I mentioned about a month ago, I think, that there were cases in, in Cox's Bazaar. You'll remember that's um, the home to about uh, 750,000 Rohingya refugees that uh, came over the border from Myanmar in 2017. So this has always been a, a place that we're, we've been worried about. But uh, UNHCR are in there with some treatment centres and quarantine facilities. So, so everyone's uh, having a go. Um, Indonesia, they also stopped their restrictions in June. Uh, and since then, there's been this, uh, uh, it was about here. So since then, you can see that it's, it has uh, gone up at, a, at an increasing rate. Um, <clears throat> hospitals, uh, uh, we know they're, they're describing overwhelmed hospitals, um, particularly uh, Jakarta, Eastern Central Java, South Sulawesi and, and South um, Kalimantan. Um, Spain um, has had to uh, lock down a little bit uh, more again, but uh, I mentioned a few weeks ago they're doing it in a, in a, in a sort of a focused way. Um, they're uh, particularly around Barcelona. Um, they've had, had some, some clusters, so, so as, as well as those, those two other places I mentioned uh, a few weeks ago. Um, they've, uh, they've reduced their, their, their gatherings as well down to maximum of 10 people. Um, they've, interestingly, they've also got mink farms. I, I didn't really understand that mink farms were, minks were a big thing still, but, um, but they've just culled 93,000 minks because of an outbreak. We've discussed outbreaks of minks in the Netherlands and Denmark before, but, uh, but uh, this is now happening in Spain. And apparently the reason to, to kill all the minks was to protect the farmer. So there you go. Um, the, uh, uh, you, you can see as we, we go through these, these charts um, how these sort of Western European countries are, are all down. Uh, you can see little uh, spikes coming up. Um, the, uh, France is, I think, doing a, a, a really good job. They're having lots of clusters, but they seem to, as we discussed last week, have that capacity to, to, to shut down clusters. Um, Belgium down, but then on the other side of Europe, you've got this Ukraine, um, Armenia, Romania, Israel, um, Netherlands. You can see a little lip nip up there. That's uh, they're largely household clusters and and clusters of friends visiting people. I guess uh, part of the holidays. Um, but uh, their first week uh, of July saw 432 cases. Uh, and the third week of July was over 900 cases. So, so they're, they've got some concerns about, again, this uh, mingling of people, which we like to do. Switzerland's going up a little bit, but then Serbia, uh, as I said, there's the, the two shapes of the outbreak in, in, in different parts of Europe. Um, also, uh, you can see through, through these graphs, Kosovo, Bulgaria. So, so that's why the, the overall graph is, uh, is fairly flat. Um, this, I, I, I don't know how this can be explained, but I will talk about deaths later. So many more cases and so few deaths. Um, and, and Brazil, um, likewise, the, the number of cases, the, 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 the climb seems to have gone off. The, the, um, they've had more cases in their indigenous people. We've discussed, talked about that before. There's about uh, 15,000 infections there and, and over 500 deaths. Um, the uh, Peru has also had infections in its in, a, in its indigenous people, and there's a tribe called Nahua, and uh, and they actually uh, 
or didn't even have contact with the outside world till the 1980s. Um, but a lot of these introductions in, the, in these countries are believed to be from healthcare workers that are, that are going there to, to help. So it's a sort of a, a bit of a, uh, a sad irony, if you like. Um, so Argentina, um, they're having about 5,000 cases a day. Um, they're, 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 they've got 800, 900 people in ICU, but still apparently it's, that's only 60% capacity. So, so they're not overwhelmed. But what I can tell you is that their test positivity rates, 33%. So that tells you that obviously cases uh, would be a lot higher. Um, I think that's about all. And, and again, the, just the last one to, to talk about is South Africa. A um, lot of social and economic hardships, imperatives to, to unlock despite what is, what is going on. Um, they've got compulsory mask wearing, but uh, apparently there's, there's pretty poor compliance. They're flip-flopping over whether to open schools or close, close, close schools. Um, and it's really spreading spreading across the country there now. So people that I've spoken to from there are fairly pessimistic about it all. Our Singapore outbreaks, um, the dorms continue, but uh, I did read the other day that there's about a quarter of a million dormitory workers are, are now back at work and uh, many of the dormitories have been unlocked, but you can still see that, uh, that, that there's still a lot of work to do. But the, the target is that uh, over the next month, uh, it, it should be, over, but this is, as we all know, been very challenging. Here's our cases in the community. I'd have to say we're happy with this. If uh, if the the circuit breaker came off uh, uh, about six weeks ago now, so if if we can rumble along at uh, at less than 20 cases a day, I've always thought that's uh, like my favourite graph, which is Korea, uh, where you just uh, shut down case, shut down, uh, identify cases and shut down clusters. So so that's where we are in in Singapore, and these are the the unlinked cases, so so generally around uh, around uh, ten or less, um, and we know a lot of those ultimately get linked. Uh, and here's the state of play now. Um, it's actually a day old. They didn't put a sit rep up today yet um, uh, for yesterday, but nonetheless, uh, forty eight thousand cases, uh, none in ICU at the moment. Uh, Twenty seven deaths, one hundred and seventy in hospital, and because we're still diagnosing so many, there's still a bit of business for our community care facilities. Um, that's that's the epi for this week, David. Thanks, Dale. I don't know that I've heard you say the word minx quite so much before, and so it's it's heartening. I didn't um, know it was a thing. I thought mink coats were you need to get there. You need to get out more, Dale. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So uh, remember to send in your questions via the Q&A tool. There's exactly one question. Uh, it's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, this this episode depends on you doing that. It, it's uh, now my great pleasure to introduce our guest tonight. Uh, he's been described as one of the world's most committed, articulate, influential, and uncompromising advocates for population health, and as an activist editor who relentlessly takes on issues beyond the traditional scope of public health, including the accountability of the medical profession, as well as human rights. Again, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor, uh, Professor Richard Horton. He's the editor-in-chief of The Lancet, co-chair of the Independent Expert Review uh, Group of the World Health Organization and honorary professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, as well as the University of Oslo. The focus of tonight's discussion is learning from COVID-19 to build a resilient future. Richard, welcome. Hey, David, very nice to be with you. Let's jump right in. Uh, what's your perspective on the responsibilities of an editor-in-chief of a leading academic medical journal during the time of COVID-19? Well, we're not frontline health workers, but it has felt this past six months as if we've been on the front line. Uh, that is to say the front line of trying to connect the most accurate and reliable knowledge to the response. Right from the very beginning in January, I think the very first paper we published was the first 41 cases described from Wuhan. Uh, on January the 24th, just to this week, where we published the results of two vaccine studies, uh, phase one, two randomized trials, one from China, one from Oxford. We we really felt this intense um, position of being at the interface between 
the creation of knowledge and the global response. So it's been a, it's been a remarkable place to sit. Um, do you see your position as editor and the editorial pages of, uh, as limitations of what you should discuss? Or do you feel that everything is free game as long as it has something to do with uh, healthcare? Yeah, I mean, the, we, we have, um, I, th I think you could probably reduce it to two roles. The first role is to have a really efficient and effective peer review system so that we're getting knowledge out onto those front lines. Um, but at the same time, we're also trying to provide some perspective on what's taking place around the world and offer some comments, preliminary judgment, verdicts about what's taking place and trying to offer a view about the direction of travel um, that countries might go in. Obviously, it's a very, what, what has happened in this pandemic, and I can't think of another example like this, is that we've been plunged into this uh, moment of, of really quite terrifying political instability around the world. Um, and that, that is very difficult to navigate. A xenophobia against China, um, zero global leadership from uh, the United States, a, a collapse in public trust in many governments, particularly in Europe, which has just had the most abysmal response to the pandemic. So this is a un very unusual political context for us to be working. So, I mean, you've been the, at the helm for 25 years. You've gone through other periods of instability, relative instability. Do you see this as a a unique opportunity to use your position to, to make sure those who don't have a voice are heard. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think the, particularly I felt to try and transmit messages about the role of countries such as China to the, to the rest of the world. I mean, I, I'm, I'm really troubled by the language that is being used by the US government about both China and the World Health Organization. I mean, to see that uh, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, this week alleged that the World Health Organization and specifically its Director General was somehow directly responsible for the deaths of UK citizens, which is what he, he said, it was all over our news yesterday, that he said so on Monday. I mean, this is the most outrageous um, tissue of lies that are being perpetrated by an advanced Western nation. Um, and at the same time, as we're plunged into a Cold War with China, it's really important, I think, for, for scientists and particularly a medical journal to be explaining that the scientific and medical communities of China have performed the most astonishing work under ex extreme pressure and have done absolutely all they can to send warning sig signals to the world about this pandemic. Those who failed were us. It was our political leaders, our science policy ma makers who didn't he heed the warnings from China, who didn't he heed the warnings from the World Health Organization. So we're in this bizarre state where the truth is being ripped up and it's very important that we try and set the record, state, con the record straight constantly. But are not politicians and policymakers advised by physicians and scientists and public health officials? Are they not, do, are they not culpable? Are they not responsible? Well, I don't want to say culpable, um, but the way I would phrase it is that there, this has been the biggest science policy failure for a generation. And... And the reason why I say that is that by the last week of January, so remember January, we knew that we had a brand new virus that was related to SARS, that was transmitted from human to human, and that was tipping hundreds of patients into hospital, many of those ending up on intensive care, many of those dying, and we had no treatment, no vaccine, and as Gabriel Lung showed from Hong Kong, we were on the edge of a global pandemic. And then you had the public health emergency of international concern. And what did all of political leaders do? And what did the scientists advising them do? Nothing. 
there was a, a, a roaring silence when, in fact, all of the evidence pointed to the fact that we were going to have a pandemic ripping through the world and we didn't prepare. And, our, and the, the medical and scientific advisors to government took far too long to recognize the seriousness. Why did they? And it's an interesting question to ask why. First, because we modeled all of our responses on influenza. Big mistake. And second, for some reason, though, people just didn't believe the story coming out of China. So why was it a big mistake to model it after influenza? We've, that's, that's what we've used. That's been our platform for, for understanding. You're absolutely right. And we were modeling, but we were, David, we were modeling in, an influenza, using the models, the same models that we modeled for influenza through February and early March, when the genetic sequence of this virus was known to be SARS related from the middle of January. Um, something doesn't compute there. Uh, we should have been radically changing our, our modeling so that we did think about a SARS virus with a mortality of one plus percent, not an influenza virus with a mortality of 0.1%. So it was it, very, very strange, aberrant thinking was going on in February and March. And that's why in Europe, certainly, we wasted six weeks. So why would they have that aberrant thinking? Why would they, why, why would they whistle past the, uh, pardon the, the phrase, wh whistle past the graveyard when What's to their advantage to, to not act? Well, it's a good, good question. Uh, I think that, that there was a fear of raising an alarm signal that might actually not turn out to be true. And I, th I, I do believe that there was a skepticism about the evidence that was coming out of China, which, I, which is mysterious. Um, if our scientific advisors or even our politicians had contacted uh, the scientists on the front line of managing this pandemic in, in China, they would have learned very quickly uh, what was taking place and the accuracy and the reliability of the data that was coming out of China. It was only when the evidence was coming from Lombardy in Italy that people really woke up. And that was, th that was the wasted weeks of February and March. So it is, it, this, these are questions that are going to have to be pondered on and reflected on when we do eventually have the many national inquiries. We're going to get back to these topics, uh, but let me, let me shift a little bit. Uh, where were the learning points uh, from, uh, for the Lancet from its experience with uh, the retracted hydroxychloroquine article? I had to ask. Well, that, of <laughs> course, no. I mean, and these are, I mean, we, we ask the same questions. Um, you know, I think the, the entire system of publication um, depends upon trust. You know, if you submit a paper to me, David, um, you never do, but if you did, um, then I don't, my first thought is, I don't think that you're lying to me. I think that you're telling me the truth, and I will send your paper out for review based upon the idea that you're telling me the truth. Um, and that's what we did with this particular paper. The reviews didn't raise any signals of concern. Um, in our discussions, we were enthusiastic about the paper. Uh, and then it turns out that, in fact, the whole thing is a monumental fabrication. Um, and, you know, the New England Journal goes through exactly the same story. So we, we both were taken in by this fraud. What does that tell me? That tells me that we need to be be a little bit more suspicious about work that comes in from a database that we're not fully familiar with and we weren't fully familiar in retrospect about this Surgisphere database. Um, but it also tells me we mustn't overreact. Um, it would be very easy to uh, overreact and make the process of publication even more bureaucratic. Trust is an absolute crucial principle that keeps science sane and efficient. And if we lose trust, then I think we'll be in a very bad place. So we do have to put in better checks uh, on databases. We do, in this particular case, only one of the four authors um, had actually seen the alleged data, um, and the other authors 
hadn't double checked those data as it turned out. So we are going to have to require authors to pay much more attention and take responsibility for the data that they submit to us. How has the Lancet responded to the, I'm sure there's an avalanche of submissions. How, how have you possibly uh, ramped up to deal with this? Yeah, there has been. And uh, I would say that we've probably had about five times the number of submissions that we would normally expect to receive. So it has been a phenomenal um, avalanche, actually. I mean, the way we've done it, and this, of course, is the same, the co the same cost that society has had in other dimensions of healthcare, is we've had to devote, it's abating a little now, but we've had to devote the majority of our editorial resources to the pandemic. And that's meant that other areas of our work um, have been pushed to one side. At the beginning of the year, in fact, I went to Geneva and Dr. Tedros helped launch this commission on the future of child and adolescent health. Um, we'd planned that 2020 was going to be a year of campaigning for children and adolescents. Well, that whole project went to one side. Um, we have an ongoing interest in climate and health. And we planned a very big launch for our climate uh, commission uh, and what we call a countdown report towards the end of this year because the conference of parties was going to be held in Glasgow and we, we had a huge project to launch that piece of work. Well, that's all been cancelled. So, you know, there are many dimensions of what we do, which were big priorities, which have just been swept aside. And that's one of my concerns now, that it's absolutely right that we put COVID-19 center stage. But we've got to be really careful that all of the other work we do, all of our other concerns don't get displaced because for the first six months of this year, everything has got pushed to one side. Can't you just spin off another, the Lancet, the other stuff? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we've got, you know, there are 170, 180 people who work across the Lancet group. Um, and I'd love to double that number, but uh, I don't think I'd get away with that. Well, I'm, I'm getting texted questions from my friends and their question, their real question, uh, despite all the polite uh, verbiage is, uh, what's happened to my manuscript? So why are authors, <laughs> Why are authors submitted, uh, who submit ar uh, articles to the Lancet only passionate when their articles rejected? Do they not feel strongly beforehand? If I handwrite a letter to accompany my initial submission to the Lancet, is there a greater chance of acceptance? Yeah, you know, it's funny, it's true. Um, I think this is the way we teach people to write science. Um, it's always in the third person. It's always, um, it, we always tell people to take out the adjectives um, to be very descriptive and very dry, and that's fine. We learn that from school science. Um, but actually, you've got to, you know, every day you get up, you work crazy hours, you're in at the weekends, you, you leave your families behind, you neglect your children, um, and you, 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 you adopt all of these perverse and very um, uh, adverse behaviors because you love what you do. And then you write up your work and it's the most boring um, description of, of your life that you could possibly tell. And it's only when we reject a piece of work that we suddenly, the, the passion comes out, the fire comes out because you're so angry that these editors could be so stupid. Well, please convey the passion for what you do when you write your paper. We want you to be passionate. We want to understand why you believe what you've done is important. Um, and, and oftentimes that passion is not conveyed. Um, so we are all passionate about what we do. We're all very committed. And that commitment should come through your work. Well said, thank you. So there'll be some couplets maybe uh, as part of in the discussion of uh, an article, I don't know. And the um, next time I come to Singapore, you know, if ever I do, I obviously haven't done anything this year, but I do do workshops in teaching scientific writing. And that's one of the things that you try and get people to convey. You know, what, why do you love your subject? Why do you love what you do? Explain that and then try and get that love for what you do somehow embedded in your paper so that you convey it. Mm. What are your thoughts regarding uh, study results being publicly discussed as well as clinical guidance decisions and public policy decisions being made based on preprint 
pre-peer-reviewed articles, for example, with hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir. And well, the whole pre yeah, no, the whole preprint uh, revolution has really taken off um, thanks to COVID-19. At the very beginning of the pandemic, we signed up, along with many other medical journals, uh, a commitment that all information, uh, all knowledge that was being created by the research community should be available as quickly as possible. And that meant that authors could post their work on preprint servers or on institutional websites before it was submitted to medical journals. And we, would, we wouldn't mind that. We would, in fact, encourage that. And I, th I think that ha has had advantages and disadvantages. The advantages is certainly that important clinical trial data, um, important ideas are getting out into the community faster. That's a good thing. But we've also seen some downsides where some misinformation, even disinformation quite possibly, um, has been put on preprint servers and has then had to be taken down because it's, it's false. So we have to be, you know, you're, it's, it's what WHO has called this infodemic. Um, you've got to manage information very carefully. You've got, you've got, there are good reasons to get material out there quickly, but you've got to be careful that you don't then fuel um, the disinformation machine, which has certainly been a, an unfortunate aspect of COVID-19. Um. Rob John from Cambridge would like to know, how can we make ma mask wearing epidemiological uh, common sense and not weapons in a culture war? Yeah, I mean, the d debate over mask wearing um, has reached new depths, certainly in my country, where there were newspaper headlines last week referring to mask Nazis. Um, I mean, really quite remarkable, um, quite remarkable language. You know, th th this is a, I think that we are, going through a challenge to some of our most cherished ideas. And this is a transition phase. Um, Aaron Dati Roy, writing early this year, talked about COVID-19 as being a portal uh, where we're going from one world into another. And I think the issue around mask wearing is an example of that because it's, a, it's about adjusting our behavior not just to protect ourselves, but actually to protect other people. Um, it's about being willing to give up some of what we see as our liberties in order to enhance the liberties of others. Um, it's, it's in a sense an expression of our global solidarity or our solidarity in our communities. It's trying to answer the question, what do we owe to each other? And these are, these are very subtle, um, questions that go to some of the deepest roots of our societies today. So I think this is a transition. Um, I think we are getting there in terms of a, a greater public acceptance of, of mask wearing. We're going to have the same issue if we do get a vaccine, David. You know, you've got the anti-vaccination movement that's mobilizing right now, um, particularly in the United States, but elsewhere too. Um, and how, to what extent are people going to be willing to take a vaccine for the greater good? These are, these are not easy questions to answer, but I do think there's going to be a big shift in society as a result of this pandemic. We're not going to go back to where we were before, and in many ways, that's a good thing. Mm. Uh Gail Cross, Dr. Gail Cross from Singapore would like to know, what measures are you aware of that are being taken to ensure that there's vaccine equity, not only for those who have governments that can afford it? Yeah, the issue of vaccine nationalism is, is, is really concerning. Um, and uh, what we're seeing at the moment is countries, including my country, um, buying uh, potential vaccines already, putting in bids for potential vaccines or, already. This is not the way to go because otherwise it's just going to be uh, whoever's the strongest country, whoever's got the deepest pockets will buy up all the vaccine. And, and that's not the right way to obviously to distribute a vaccine. A vaccine needs to go to those who need it most. We know those who need it most, older populations, people with chronic illnesses, black and minority ethnic communities, people who are working on the front line, such as health workers. 
in every country, we know who should get the vaccine first. So there needs to be some mechanism to bring countries together to agree some framework for the purchasing, the procurement, and the distribution of a vaccine. Now, one of the things, David, that I'm, I, I, I just cannot understand this at all, but ever since a, the, the, the public health emergency of international concern was declared, there has not been a single moment where the countries of the world have come together to discuss the pandemic and to discuss the priorities about what to do regarding the pandemic. Not one, not one global meeting. WHO hasn't convened an emergency World Health Assembly. The, one, the, the, the meeting they had in May just passed a resolution which didn't amount to anything significantly. The United Nations hasn't called an emergency special, emergency special session of the General Assembly, which it could do because this epidemic is a threat to global peace and security. So there's been a vacuum, a, 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 a terrifying vacuum of global political leadership. And we need countries to come together to do it, to answer exactly the question you're asking me, which is to figure out a way for an equitable distribution of any therapeutics um, or any vaccine that we develop. But that hasn't happened. Mm. Why? Why hasn't it happened? Mr. Gutierrez, why hasn't it happened? Why haven't you convened an emergency, emergency special ses session of the UNGA? Perhaps he'll watch this webinar. <laughs> um, yeah, Amy Stebbings uh, writes, uh, can you give us insights as to why the UK death rates are so high? Is it a different virus? Is it because of temperate weather changes? Is it because of the government? Well, um, we, we do have a high uh, absolute number and a high, um, a high mortality uh, per million population. That is absolutely true. The, I mean, the, the, the fundamental reason um, is that we locked down too late. So that refers back to what, what we were talking about at the beginning of the conversation. But there are aspects of the epidemic in the UK which have been peculiar. Uh, we discharge people from the National Health Service um, to clear capacity for the anticipated avalanche of patients with COVID-19. We dis discharge people from the NHS without testing them, put them back into, for example, care homes where the epidemic became seeded and a very large proportion of the deaths that we've seen have taken place in care homes because we have a very divided system here. The health system is utterly separate from the social care system. And so there was no coordination between the two. Um, and looking back, that was, that was a terrible, terrible mistake. Um, I think that the, the lateness of the lockdown and the, the divisions between the health and social care system were particularly important. But we, um, there are other aspects too. We didn't have personal protective equipment available early enough um, because we hadn't planned for that. And we knew several years ago that we didn't have enough PPE, but we didn't plan for that. And of course, although the sanitary movement was born in 19th century Britain, um, we've eroded our public health system to the point of decrepitude. Um, and that meant that we had no ability to scale up a test, trace, and isolate system in the early phase of the epidemic. And it's only now that we're building that. Well, you know, you don't have to have a PhD in public health to know that without a proper TTI system, you're not going to be able to manage an outbreak such as this. So will this lead to a change in government? No, it will not lead to, in the UK, it will not lead to a change in government. This government's got a large majority, will be here for another four years. Um, but I'm hoping it will lead to a reprioritization within the government. Um, and then of course we, you know, the, the most important question is what happens in November in the United States election. If we have another four years of uh, President Trump, then we basically will see the death of multilateralism the further destruction of the United Nations, and even more global instability. So we all have an interest in making sure, sorry to say, that we, we don't go in that direction. Dale? 
Yeah, thanks, uh, Richard. I want to tie a few questions together. One, the, uh, earlier on when you were talking about uh, why did all the countries ignore um, the, the messages coming out of China at the beginning, but, but it's actually still happening. Um, Audrey Cheer has written in the, in the list, how can journals like Lancet better educate policymakers and national leaders who do not necessarily think highly of science or on subject matter experts? And that's the thing that I find the most frustrating. We, we can publish in, in, in journals and we can be vocal, but then it, it, it's like the, the outbreak response world uh, was never, never had two minds about what was happening in China. Uh, it, was, it was getting the message through to, to leaders who obviously have got a lot of other priorities, but can Lancet or, or how can how can people not, and I'm not talking about Singapore, I think there's, there's a good relationship here, just, just to make that clear. But, um, but uh, other countries who, I think they say we're, we're listening to our medical experts, but they're either getting bad advice or they're not listening to their medical experts because you can't yeah, just yeah. unlock when you're not ready because you want to. Uh, you, if you're locking yeah. down, you've got to do something different. I mean, I, it's, it's an important question, Dale, and I, I, and I think there is a question about, first, the scientific literacy of our politicians, our political class. Um, certainly in my country, um, science is not a background for many political leaders and civil servants. Um, most people have been trained in the humanities which are wonderful, in, of course, but you need to have a mix within government. You need to have people who do have literacy in science and who are able to understand quantitative information when it's presented to them. I can remember, for example, in the days when Jens Stoltenberg was the Prime Minister of Norway, Tore Goddell used to work just down the corridor. And um, the way Tore Goddell persuaded Jens Stoltenberg to invest in Gavi and to take up MDGs four and five. He literally just walked down the corridor and he could sit with him and show him data in a scientific paper about under five mortality, about the importance of vaccines. And, and Jens Stoltenberg, who uh, could understand quantitative information, could get it immediately um, and didn't need to have it um, explained to him. He, he really got it. We don't have, in many cases, leaders who do get it, but, Angela, but there are a few, and if you look at their countries, they perform well. Angela Merkel um, has a scientific background. She got it very quickly, um, and Germany has had a relatively good performance. So I think partly it's, it's, about, it's about that. Um, and I think perhaps also um, we do need to think, um, because we've all made mistakes, and, and I think if I look back myself, um, I think what more could we have done to promote what we published at the end of January? And I think there was more that we, we, we could have done. Um, so we, we, we all need to reflect on that. Uh, next question is from uh, uh, Prof. Chang Yap Singh, who's asked, uh, Richard, would you like to comment on Singapore's management of COVID-19 so far? Remember where you are. <laughs> <laughs> Virtually. <laughs> well, I think Singapore's been an exemplar. Um, and I mean, I think one of the things that's um, always now I'm, now you're going to think that I'm just saying this, to be <laughs> nice. but um, one of the things that has been very impressive about Singapore, but it, actually not just Singapore, um, New Zealand the same, relatively s small um, countries, um, there is an ability to have a proximity between the scientific and medical com communities and the political class. Um, and, and so when I look at New Zealand, for example, there was a Jacinda Ardern has, has just been incredible because she got good science policy advice and she's close to the science policy and medical community. And it's the same, it's the same with you, relatively small population and country. And there aren't these big gaps between the community. So I, th I think small can be good. Look at Scotland. Scotland's had a relatively good um, uh, pandemic, so to speak, in the way that it's managed things, because again, the, the go Scottish government has a very close relationship with its advisors. So I think there's a certain 
you know, there's a certain issue of trust, um, proximity, closely working together um, that has meant that countries like Singapore, New Zealand, Scotland have, have, have performed above expectations. Uh, James Miller has posed uh, the following question. In May, The Lancet published an editorial stating that Americans must put a president in the White House come January 2021 who will understand that public health should not be guided by partisan politics. Is this advocacy and partisanship an appropriate line to take for an ostensibly medical, uh, medical journal? It's absolutely necessary. Um, I, I mean, you know, we're not a political magazine. We're a medical journal, it's true. But I mentioned in the sanitary movement a few moments ago, um, the great leaps in health that have taken place over recent centuries haven't just come because of some great randomized trial published in a journal. The great leaps in health have come through political struggle. And it's on the front lines of political struggle that you win victories for the health and well-being of your population. Now, who is, who's going to engage in that struggle? Um, are we going to stand on the sidelines and say that's not a struggle for us? No, I mean, that's completely ridiculous. We should be absolutely on the front line of that political struggle. In fact, if you're going to publish research evidence, we have a responsibility, I would say a moral responsibility, to use that evidence as a platform for political struggle, for a more equitable and healthier society. So I don't think you can depoliticize medicine or depoliticize science. Exactly the opposite. We need to repoliticize medicine and repoliticize science in the sense that we need to use the products of science to advance the health and well-being of our communities. Well said. Um, Alex Cook from Singapore would like to know what your thoughts on uh, PHE banning manufacturer from selling uh, PPE to the National Health Service in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland? That's a very specific question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I may not be able to answer the, uh, okay. the, the details <laughs> of that. I would just say that Public Health England, um, it, while a, a wonder, filled with wonderful people um, and uh, highly talented individuals, has not exactly distingu distinguished itself um, during the course of this pandemic. And uh, it's another example, I think, of where we're going to have to inquire as to why PHE was invisible. It's, it was one of the reasons we, we didn't build a test trace isolate system because Public Health England wouldn't allow, um, wouldn't lose control of the system and wouldn't allow other laboratories to contribute to it. Mm. Uh, Catherine Ong from Singapore has asked, COVID-19 is probably going to be uh, to stay uh, in the world. How do you see future of air travel while being safe? Well, I think this is, uh, as the science has progressed, um, this is one of, the, one of the great concerns because we now know that a very substantial proportion of transmission can be from people who are asymptomatic, number one. And number two, um, the risk of airborne transmission, um, I think we now understand is far greater than we thought even just a few months ago. So those two issues, airborne transmission and asymptomatic transmission, mean that the calculus of risk is, is much more difficult. Um, and, it, and of course, it pushes you more towards uh, wearing of masks, thinking about ventilation, thinking about air filtration. Um, and so getting on an aircraft, um, certainly for those at higher risk, might not be the most sensible thing to do right now. And that, that's why we need to do all that we can to suppress viral transmission. Um, yes, we're going to have to live in peaceful coexistence, David, with this virus, but, virus, but we have to work as much as possible to, live, to see if we can live in a zero COVID world. Um, and that's not gonna be absolutely possible, but we need to work towards it. Otherwise, we're not gonna be able to uh, to, to, to travel as much as we did. But actually, you know what? Not traveling as much, it's good for carbon. Excellent. Uh, COVID-19 has distracted many of, uh, of us from the usual give and take with our governments. Has that distraction allowed unfettered authoritarian tendencies in the name of public health policy 
to flourish or were they unrelated events? U.S. and Hong Kong are examples. Yeah, no, well, that's a very good question. And uh, I mean, if we, talk about, if we talk about China and Hong Kong for a moment, um, you know, the imposition of the national security law in Hong Kong is a cause for immense concern. Um, sometimes it's, 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 um, sometimes it's very hard to be a friend to every aspect of China. And, uh, uh, I understand the, the reasons why the national security law was imposed because of concerns about political stability and public order, but the, the draconian nature of that national security law, um, leads all of us to be extremely concerned about the future for Hong Kong citizens. Um, it is a, con it is a, a worry that that law has been imposed while the world is distracted. Um, but at the same time, I think we are also seeing a pushback from, um, from many countries, for example, with the lifting of extradition laws. Um, so that, there has been a reaction. The Chinese government is being held accountable for that decision. Uh, my worry is for the medicine and science in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a global epicenter for great medical research. And I know that from my friends in Hong Kong, they're very worried that the network of inter international collaborations that they will have will diminish. They're very worried that, that students will leave Hong Kong it will be harder to attract international students into Hong Kong. And they're, so they're concerned that the national security law will actually um, erode the quality and capacity for high quality, world, cl world class medical science in Hong Kong. So I, I hope that we can do all, all we can to maintain those collaborations. One last question, and, and Dale, I apologize, uh, but uh, just one last question. You've mentioned that uh, previously that every good editor should be fired. Are you disappointed? <laughs> yes. Well, the reason why I said that and still say that is that um, you, you should never become um, comfortable in your role and you should always retain the capacity, capacity to be shocked by what you see around you. Um, and that means sometimes that you let your passion overcome your reason. And that means that you will sometimes take a decision or write something um, which can get you into difficulty. Um, and that's good. Um, you should always retain your passion, your commitment, and your capacity to be shocked. And if sometimes you, you go over the edge and that leads you to get fired, well, at least it shows you've got some humanity. Um, the fact that I haven't been fired yet well, maybe there's a question mark over my humanity. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We could go on forever and ever, but we've got Thanks. to get to Dale. Dale, over to you. Thanks, David. You bet. Um, I want to talk this week about deaths. I mentioned that earlier. Um, measures of performance, which, uh, which is building on from, from last week. A few things that have happened as a, as a follow-up. And, and also following on from that, uh, what happened in, in Dharavi. So... So in, in terms of deaths, um, you, you might think that when you're reporting deaths in countries, uh, it's, it's very straightforward and, and basically it's not. Um, you can read that uh, WHO case definition of a COVID death. We always need case definitions to, to standardize things, but notice having COVID-19 and dying does not mean you died from COVID-19 in short. So it has to be resulting from a cl clinically compatible illness in a probable or confirmed case. So um, you, you can look at a death certificate like this, and obviously if you've got COVID-19 as an associated thing, but you died of shock from aortic dissection in a motor vehicle accident, then you could say, okay, that's quite clear. You didn't die because of COVID. You just happened to have COVID at the same time. But it's not that clear cut because we know it does have uh, thromboembolic phenomenon and vasculitic phenomenon and you look at one like here and this is straight off the WHO website that heart failure due to myocardial infarction with COVID-19 is not regarded as a COVID death and you might rem remember that in um, in Singapore sometimes you'll see on the news that uh, the reported deaths but then just uh, underneath there'll be a little 
asterisk and it might say nine others died with COVID. So we're actually following, following this, but it's already showing some of the, the complexities. So we know a lot of people are dying and these are the, the highest death rates uh, currently around the world, Brazil, US, India, uh, this one's Mexico, Colombia, all the South American countries, South Africa's coming up. So um, the UK one coming down, obviously, as, the, as their cases come down. And we also know that uh, in Brazil, they, they ran out of coffins. This is back in, in May. Um, we know there's uh, requests in uh, Arizona, Texas, and uh, other parts of the US to get refrigerated trucks in for, for quite brutally just to, to store dead bodies in anticipation of, of what's going to happen. So, so, so this is a, a sort of a harsh reality. This is from uh, a graphic from the Financial Times. And it actually looks at all cause death rates, right? So, uh, this is so this is from uh, uh, this was done on June twenty sixth. Okay, so I pulled out one of my old uh, charts uh, for for mid uh, mid to late June, and and you can see that the the death rates here. So here's here's UK is sixty five thousand seven hundred deaths more than the averages from previous years. But if you look over here, it's only 42,000 deaths. So somehow there's excess deaths not explained by, by this. Uh, US is 119 here, uh, over here it's 149. So back in June, there's 30,000 extra people have died. Uh, and, and, uh, but apparently not from, from COVID. What was Brazil's 50,000, um, where's that gone? There, here it's 54,000. So pretty much in, in most of these countries, not all of them, we find the excess deaths are more than the baseline plus COVID. So this brings you to wonder why. Now, let's, this is a, a, a group called um, Euromomo. Um, I didn't name it. Uh, that's a, a consortium of, uh, of 24 countries in Europe putting, putting their data together over, over years. You can see there's uh, there's a blip every uh, winter, uh, but but look here. So wh whatever age, 75 to 84, big blip in the first half of this year. Big blip in the first half of this year for 65 to 74. Look at this, also 45 to 64, but even 15 to 44. Now the, the y-axis is not the same size, but this all-cause mortality is really spreading across all countries and in all age groups uh, except children which are fortunately small in number. So um, now this is a paper that came out in, in JAMA a couple of weeks ago, and this actually shows even excess deaths and other causes. So this is deaths from heart disease, deaths from diabetes, cerebrovascular disease, Alzheimer's. So what, what does all this mean? Well, this, this means that um, either there's the excess mortality is due to undiagnosed COVID cases, it's due to unreported COVID cases. If, uh, and we know some countries have actually had to, to do a catch up uh, to, to catch up on all their deaths. India did it, um, uh, uh, China certainly did it. Um, maybe they just don't meet the WHO definition. Um, maybe they're increased deaths from non-COVID disease. We know cancer screening's down, other vaccinations are down. So if someone is dying because they're cancer, they couldn't get their cancer care or their heart attack care, then that obviously matters as well. So the moral of the story is that we really should be looking at all cause mortality rather than uh, bringing in the subjectivity of saying, was it caused by COVID? So that's my little set. That also acts as a segue to the, the measures of performance. And I don't know if, uh, if uh, Richard's still with us, but uh, you'll recall last week we, we showed that uh, it's not just about the case numbers. Um, you've really got to look at, uh, at a number of features, which we went down here. And I think um, we've, uh, we're seeing that WHO, uh, I'm not saying they did it because of this paper, but, but they're now not, not just looking at, at positive results, they've taken, they've taken in some of, some of the things that, I, that coincidentally uh, came up in our paper. So that's the testing rate uh, in the last week. Um, so it's not overall testing rate. Um, and they've put, put numbers there per thousand population or whatever, per million population. Um, 
So this is important. Um, the, uh, the positivity rate could also be in there and also the testing strategy. So they're now applying this, whether, whether you only test people with symptoms, um, with, whether, uh, or sorry, meet people with symptoms and meet specific criteria. So it could be in a certain area or in a certain age group or whatever, uh, anyone showing any symptoms and then open public testing. And, and obviously if you've got uh, a high testing rate and, uh, and, and uh, open public testing, then you can get a maximum score of seven. Whereas if you don't have that many tests and you've got very restricted access to them, then, then you will score less. So this is trying to put a little bit of uh, metrics to, to, to all this. And that, that kind of brings me to Melbourne because it, 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 it is, uh, I heard um, Gail was, uh, was on, the, on the webinar. This will bring heart flutters to, to people from Melbourne, uh, seeing Flinders Street Station and our tram, but anyway, they're having a really hard time. And they, I, I'm quite sure they unlocked because their, their numbers were, were low. And what we're seeing is that now they've got, uh, this is at least of yesterday, over 3,000 cases currently active. Over 1,000 of them are unlinked. So you'll remember we said capacity to identify cases and shut down transmission chains. There's healthcare workers affected. There's many, many, uh, I, I think hundreds of healthcare workers on, on home quarantine. Um, there's 45 aged care settings that are, that are affected. Um, public housing, six prisons, uh, including two youth correction centers, um, meat processing plants. These are all the places we know are hotspots for COVID, um, yet unlocking has seen them all get affected. So, so clearly the numbers achieved by, by, by locking down uh, you know, a city, a country, a region. Also the turnaround time for tests uh, I saw on one of the hospital's websites, if, if we haven't phoned you with your results in five days, please get back to us. And you start to wonder what's, what's the point five days later. Um, so they've introduced as of last night, um, uh, compulsory uh, face masks for, for, the, for the population. And that may be the, the first, uh, uh, I guess, non-Asian or Western country, if you like, that's, uh, that actually uh, fines people for not wearing masks now. Um, we looked at prisons. Uh, this is a picture I took in, uh, in, in February. We knew these were hotspots and I think we've had maybe one case in, in the Singapore prison. So, so you've really got to give some of these areas special attention. Here's the prisons. Um, they, these are the, I think the top 10 uh, sites for prison outbreaks in, uh, in prison outbreak um, in the US. And these, these are not small numbers of cases. Um, in Egypt, uh, there's, there's uh, everywhere actually, South America, there's, there's lots of prison outbreaks everywhere. These people are often got a lot of comorbidities um, and are particularly vulnerable and they're sitting ducks. And, and we know a lot of people have uh, been released early, particularly for, for more minor crimes. So finally, just to talk about what happened in Dharavi, you, you mentioned, uh, you might remember, I put this slide up uh, uh, last week. Uh, this is uh, 2.1, this area is 2.1 square kilometers with about a million people. It's a huge slum in, in, in Mumbai. Um, there's about eight to 10 people live in every, every housing unit. And, and they had these uh, astounding numbers, thousands of, of cases through April, May, June. And then in July, they got this under control. And, and you just, uh, need to wonder why, well, so, so what did happen? They, uh, they, now there's currently 143 active cases. Notice there's no eradication. They're just working out how to keep the numbers low and, and live with it. Uh, I guess if you eradicate it, then uh, it'll just come back in from neighboring Mumbai. Um, the doubling time has gone from 18 to 43 to 78 days. And in June, there were no deaths. And they had this three-pronged strategy of containment zones. So where there was a case, they would actually put physically partition it off. Uh, lots of testing and making sure there was maintenance of supply lines so people were still getting their food. And of course, they did what everyone else should be doing, which is just the tracing, tracking, testing, and treating. They didn't have anything novel to do. They just got in and, and did it. They tested 
they went door to door, tested about 47,000 people. They, uh, they, they put up fever camps, uh, testing centers scattered throughout the slum. They went looking deliberately for senior citizens to see if any of those um, had, had any symptoms and, and did proactive swabs. Uh, they quarantined all the symptomatic people. They had some, they converted some schools and uh, na nature parks and hotels and things and turned these into to cohort centers and, and isolation facilities for contacts. They increased the, the, the toilet cleaning. And, and there were about, I understand there are only about 24 doctors that did it. This is one of the, one of the, um, one of the stadiums that's been converted into a sort of a, a, case, a hospital for mild cases. But uh, this is uh, uh, Dr. Anil Pat Pachnecker. He's, he's worked there for, for 35 years. He's a, an independent GP and it was people like him that, uh, that really rolled up their sleeves. And, and the, these people that have worked, there, there's quite a few that have worked there for, for decades and they've got such, uh, such a good relationship with the, with the community that that community engagement was no small part of, uh, of, of the trust that uh, the community could have with them to, to get tested and, and, and behave in the, in the necessary way. So um, I don't have a video this week, David, uh, but, I, but I think I've got a nice happy story for, for the ending. Thanks. Thanks, Dale. Appreciate it. Excellent as always. So it leaves me uh, to thank uh, Professor Richard Horton uh, for taking time from his busy day to be with us and sharing his uh, insight and passion. I've gotten a fair amount of feedback already and everyone is so excited for, to have, uh, have had you on this evening. Uh, and next week's speaker is uh, Chikwe Ihakwazu. He's Chief Executive Officer of National Co uh, and National Coordinator of Nigeria Center for uh, Disease Control. He's a member the World Health Organization Strategic and Technical Advisory Group for Infectious Hazards. The title of his talk will be COVID-19 in Nigeria, Africa. There's a chat box tool at the bottom of your screen. We would appreciate your feedback. The chat box will be open for another 10 minutes or so. Please give us your comments. Until next week, stay safe, wear your mask, and wash your hands. And finally, I want to thank all those who provided Pandemic Song of the Week suggestions. I've ignored them this week, but will incorporate them in future weeks. Until then, I know you'll enjoy singing along with the music video, Second Wave by the Puppet Regime. Good night.